right, I'm here with Dave Yard. He is the executive director of the National Auto and Truck Museum here in Auburn, Indiana, otherwise known as NATMIS. And Dave and I were talking before uh, we started the camera just about the unique history of this building. And we're gonna give you a whole tour of this place. Dave is a wealth of knowledge, but let's start with the building. Uh, what about this building and this museum is, you said, one of three in the entire world? It is. And um, we're, we're in the last two remaining buildings of the Auburn Automobile Company. The building to our left was built in 1923, and that was a factory service center. So if you had an Auburn Quarter Duesenberg and were a dealer and had problems with it, this is where it came for factory repairs. Downstairs was a national parts depot. So parts were shipped out worldwide wow. uh, to dealers through either Railway Express or a series of train tracks that came in through the, the property back by where the pool is out of the skate park now. This particular building was built in 1928 for the final assembly of the L29 Cord, which was America's first front wheel drive car. And as you mentioned, we are one of only three automobile museums that are still located in their original factory settings. Mercedes in Stuttgart is still in the old factory buildings there. Uh, the PK or Piquette plants, however you want to plant, uh, pronounce it, in Detroit where the Model T's were built. And right here, Natmus in the Auburn Automobile Manufacturing Building. So a lot of history here. A lot of history and I, you see the big windows. You're mentioning this was a, in a way, a poor man's air conditioner. It was. Uh, these are called monitor bays, and they, they serve two really practical purposes because back in the 20s, lighting in a factory was very poor. Mm -hmm. So it let a lot of light in here for the manufacturing. And then these windows then are opened up a uh, series of gang or on chains there. They will all open up. And, and you open the side windows and what it does, it creates a draft and pulls the hot air out. So it's a poor man's air conditioning. So a very, very practical approach to our early manufacturing. Yeah, and you're still using it today. It's, it we feels are. fairly comfortable in here. We, it does, and yeah. it's, it's they still work today, 100 years later. This building is 100 years old this year, 1923. Wow, it's hard to believe it. And you know, they made buildings differently back then. This is standing tall and strong. It and is. It's such a great place to house what we're going to talk about is all the amazing cars, the, everything in here. And like every old building, it takes an amazing amount of love to keep it going. So we have a terrific group of volunteers here on staff that really, really help keep everything going. So one of the stars is right here, uh, really the future liner, they call it. Tell us mm -hmm. about this. I know a lot of people know about Natmus because of this. What makes this special? This this is uh, our, our star of our, our museum right here. It was built in 1939 actually by General Motors for the Parade of Progress. They built 12 of these and the idea was that they would caravan all 12 of these together with 30 matching semi-tractor trailers. One year they would leave Detroit and head for the west coast to get, try to get back before the snow. Next year they would leave Detroit, try to get to like Miami and places south again be, get back before the winter or the snow arrived, then go to the east coast. So they were they were a traveling road show, basically, is what they were. Okay. And it was designed to give a glimpse of the future of what General Motors thought was coming down the road. Um, you got to remember, back in the 40s, even early 50s, most people did not get a newspaper. There was no television, so communication was, was pretty limited there. So each one of these had a unique theme there, and everything that they presented was actually like Star Wars technology wow. back in the day. Uh, for example, one of them dealt with a cutaway of a diesel electric engine and how that was going to replace a steam engine. And everybody said, that'll never happen. Another one dealt with microwave technology and how that will never happen. That would someday replace a traditional wood or coal cook stove. Uh, another dealt with this revolutionary communication device that was going to change how people communicated worldwide. And that was called a rotary dial telephone. <laughs> and every one of these had a unique theme there. Wow. And by, by about 1955, 1956, television was creeping in yeah. and there was no need for the program. So they parked these in a field General Motors did and literally let them self-destruct for 20 years. And uh, this was rescued by a gentleman in Chicago named Joe Bortz. A group of volunteers from Detroit wanted to restore it, did, and the rest is history here. So wow. it's, it's, it's an amazing piece of history here, and we're really lucky that it's here at Natmus, and, and, and uh, it, we own it here. The museum owns this, this great piece of equipment. And, and if you're watching this video, you may have seen this at any number of national, international car shows, events. It has. It's, it's been literally 
all over the United States here in different different shows. It is actually on the National Historical Register vehicle of vehicles. It's a sixth vehicle that was ever put on that record. Uh, so it, it's, it has extremely limited high status here uh, in the historical circles there. It's kind of like a World's Fair on wheels, right? And right, a lot of, that's a good way. That's a good way to describe it, it is. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the television. <laughs> That's a good, this is the predecessor to this is it you know social media in a way right everything people are everything. watching videos now now they, they before they're using something like this so is this part of uh this this was built actually by an indie race team in out okay. of indianapolis called dry named dryer rainbow the color so i didn't know if that was part of it and uh they actually came up took dimensions of the future liner this was their hospitality suite so at the 500 okay. They use this to move people. Uh, there's great big grills that pull out and everything on it. And they want it to look like a mini future liner. So it's on exhibit here now. And uh, it, it makes a great father son type of, right. of, you know, big daddy, little daddy, or whatever you want to call it there. there. But uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice compliment to the future liner here. And he said we can go in there? Yes, oh, sure. We sure can. And, and uh, let's go up in the top and, and get behind the wheel because you'll see, you get a whole different perspective up there, especially the amount of blind spots that there are. You'd think you've got a panoramic view and you do, but anything close, uh, you, you can't see. This is quite taller than even a semi. I can go in? Yeah, there's room for you. You, take, you go up there with the camera too there, so. But you wanna get behind the wheel. <laughs> That's incredible. It is. It's exciting. It gets a lot of attention and uh, just a once in a lifetime experience of something like this that we get to share with the public. Absolutely. And you got to see it in person. That's all I got to say. Um, awesome. Well, why don't we continue down? And uh, I know this is the star of the show, but there's, there's just a wealth. You know, I love all the memorabilia, the Petroliana, we call it sometimes, the gas pumps. Um, but what are we looking at uh, this, here? This, this group right here is a collection we call Fins of the 50s. And you can start to see the evolution of the fins of the cars going from smaller all the way up through the 59 Cadillac, which had the most outrageous big fins here. So again, oh just God. to show the evolution of the fins on the back of cars through time here. We've got a uh, Hudson display Ooh. of some of the finest Hudsons in the country right here. A couple unique vehicles here. I love a good Hudson. We've got a couple good Hudson sell through our auction. Uh -huh. We love Hudsons at Worldwide. This particular vehicle looks like a Mattel Hot Wheels, like a giant toy, is really unique. It was built in 1949 by Detroit Mechanical for a man named Bill Hara. And Bill Hara started his casino in Reno. Uh -huh. And what he did in 1949, he had this custom made or built, and he would start pulling cars back to Reno to start his museum, the Harris Collection there. So this was his tractor trailer to start to pull collector cars back to Reno there. Wow restored for sure yes in impeccable condition this is seeing the whole country some unique vehicles here in the collection we've got a terrific display of model a's here mm -hmm. uh, part of these napma zones and part of them are loaned from the model a ford foundation at the gilmore museum we also have a model a powered airplane over there oh let's let's Park right next to a Model A mail truck, and I like to kid people and say we offer air mail service here at Natmus. So that, but, that's uh, the the engines from a Model A. Yep. I, mean, I love Model A's, but show me the, this airplane. And then the uh, this is called a 1929 Pete and Pull Air Camper. You would buy the plans for it, use the Model A engine and such there, and uh, you could build your own airplane. <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to imagine it. This is almost state of the art back in the day it's here. It's like taking a but, V6, uh, V6 today and saying, let's put an assessment out of it. Or yeah, an airplane that, out that's, of that's it. right. That's exactly wow. right there. That is so cool. Is there anything uh, down here? Sure. Oh, look at that. The, the GMC Motorhome. This was an early one. 
It was owned by a GMC executive and it's all original, hasn't been restored. And he donated that a couple years ago. His name was Bob Sobis from Fenton, Michigan. And one of the unique features is his little tow car with it here. Oh. It's a little Chevette. And most of the Chevettes are long gone. They rushed it out. But the thing that makes this one really unique is it's a diesel powered Chevette. And I think they only made like 1,200 of them there. So it's, wow. a, it's a pretty rare little combination here. But uh, again, just very, very fortunate to have it here at Natmus and as part of the collection here. First of all, you got the little REO um, wagon here that was used in uh, Cincinnati by the Gurky Brewery Company. And it literally hauled cakes of beer around Cincinnati and delivered them from the brewery there. But this actually plied the streets of Cincinnati, runs well to this day. but. Uh, this was a big step up from the horse and buggy days. Right, right. Horse and buggy with an engine that can haul. Yeah. Beer. Yeah. It's a big and then deal. the Mack truck back here is really unique. And if you notice, it's chain driven. You can see the big chains on both sides there. And this this truck actually hauled coal around uh, Chicago back during the Depression. And they told the drivers, well, even with a red light and you're, when you got a load of coal on, don't stop for anything. Because what would happen, people were broke and they had didn't have any money for heat or anything. Mm. So if the truck slowed down, people would climb up on the back and start throwing coal off so people could pick it up and take it home. If you look on top, you'll see like a little filigree metal around the top up uh -huh. there. That's not for design. That's razor sharp. So yep. if people grabbed a hold of it there, it was going to cut their fingers there. Another unique feature about the Mack truck here, if you notice, the radiator is just in front of the firewall. It's not out here like a traditional vehicle is. And the reason for that is the Teamsters were still using a lot of horse-drawn vehicles in Chicago, mm -hmm. and they saw these trucks as a threat to their well-being and their existence. So what they would do is they carried a big rod with them, and whenever one of these trucks would stop, they would take and try and stick that through the radiator to damage the truck. So somebody came up with the idea, let's put the radiator behind the engine, and that way if they try to damage it with a rod or something, they won't get to the radiator. So you're telling me they couldn't stop for people stealing coal. Right. Or, or Teamsters trying to, trying to destroy the truck. Wow. Yeah. Where are we? What are we looking at now? Where we are we looking. Go? We're looking at this is Muscle Car Row right here, and uh, these are some early muscle cars from the '60s and early early '70s here. Um, some very very rare cars here in the collection. As we mentioned, we talked earlier the General Lee right here. This is the one that did the opening jump scene, the actual opening jump scene, the original for the, the uh, for the Dukes of Hazard TV series. There, uh, it went 18 feet in the air, 83 feet, and it hit so hard that it actually buckled the car. And if you look over here, you can see oh. here on the, the roof pillar and in the front where the car buckled there. I love that history. They, they destroyed 369 chargers during that film series. Now, depending on the car, sometimes you want to restore it, sometimes you want to leave it. This is one you want to leave. This was owned by Warner Brothers and, and uh, it's worth more just like that than restored. I mean, you can tell it's, it's well used. <laughs> Many jumps. Many jumps. A couple of really unique cars that we have here. Uh, the Pontiac, 62 Pontiac, that's a Super Duty. Mm -hmm. And I think they only made 17 of these. And I think there's only like five in existence. The Yanko Camaro, 427 Yanko Camaro, Super Chevy there, uh, rare, rare car. And then for the other crowd, the arch crowd and such there, behind you, this plain looking white Ford. I was wondering about right here, so Victoria. Uh, Did you park uh, here this morning? Yeah, <laughs> yeah wait a minute. No, I, no, I look that old and I'm driving a Ford. <laughs> but uh, this is actually Catherine Hepburn, the, the famous oh. movie actress, her last car. Makes sense. And uh, we get a lot of people that come in that uh, still remember Catherine Hepburn. So I've we, heard we, of her. Yeah, that's right. But we, we try, and in, in our future goal with the museum is we try to make our collection inclusive for everybody. Uh -huh. We really want something for everybody. And you have to be looking at the future. You just can't 
keep the old stuff. You've got to bring in a new that represents the younger generation and what their interests are. So as you look around, you'll see we've got a very diverse collection here. And, and that's not by accident, it's by design. Oh, I, I love it. There's something for everyone. Uh, even I have a four-year-old who loves cars mm -hmm. and you know he can actually tell you what a Porsche versus a Auburn is, which is I'm pretty proud of. Uh huh. Uh, but there's something for everyone. And, there is. And there's history, there's prominence, there's provenance. Well, this, let's talk about the gas pumps real quick, because the, there's the, a Tokine. There were, these were made in, the Tokine Corporation was located in Fort Wayne. And these pumps have just recently all been donated here. It's the world's largest collection of Tokine pumps. Tokine, Wayne, and uh, Bowser were all under the Tokine uh, umbrella here. But uh, we've got the world's largest gathering of these pumps. Uh, they're just magnificently restored, represent almost every model that was ever built by Tokine. And then we have in our library uh, the, all the Tokine archives for everything connected with Tokine from day one from I when they were located in Iowa until they closed in about 2000 in Fort Wayne. We've got every marketing piece, every design, every blueprint. So if anybody ever wants to know anything about Tokine pumps doing research, this is where you want to be. This is ground zero. We have it all here wow. uh, in atmosphere. Just a terrific, terrific display. Love, yeah, I mean, perfect for museums, garages. It um, is. And, and if we walk this way with Auburn Court Duesenberg weekend coming up real soon here, I want to talk a little bit about the dealership uh -huh. that we built here, our volunteers built here about two years ago during COVID when we had a little extra time. Oh, is that a boat sale? Yeah, this is a, uh, uh, a dealership about what would have been like back in the day in a in a mid-sized, middle-sized city. It's all stick built. That's real brick on it there. This oh. is a showroom on the left. Yep, feel it. So yeah. those are all individually Verified. laid there. And um, but this is what a dealer showroom would look like right here. The garage over here on the right would have been a one bay garage where they they would have repaired or worked on cars. And the unique thing about this is that. There's an old saying, what's new was old and what's old was new. If you take a look at that lift there that the, the Auburn is on there, that lift was actually built in the late 20s there. Huh. And it looks just about like a four post lift that you buy today, you know, to put right. in your home or whatever there. This works, our volunteers have it operable. But again, it's a concept that is just basically the same cable driven lift that we buy today for our home usage or even in, in garages there. If it's that's right. Right. Broken, that's right. you fix it, right? That's right. So two really fine restored examples of L29 quartz, which were final assembly here in this very building right here. The Pratt Elkhart was built in Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, just a magnificent brass car and uh, runs, it runs excellent. But uh, you can just see that uh, the amount of work it would take to keep a car up like that there with the polishing and everything on it there. Yeah. They're beautiful. They're, it's artwork on wheels, some say, but the difference is you can enjoy and yep. drive these. Yep. The little Model A Ford, the red one, this is unique. This is a 1903 Model A Ford. It's the fourth oldest Ford on the planet. Ford Motor Company owns the two oldest. A gentleman in Canada is number three. This is number four. And uh, people want to say Dave, they didn't make a Model A in 1903. They only made the Model A Ford from 1928 to 1931. But when Ford started building cars, hand built them, uh, his first model was called a Model A. Then he made the next change uh, or improvements was a B, a C, a D, E, F, G, all the way up through Model T. Yeah. And everybody says you could only get a Ford in any color you wanted in black. Well, when he first started it out, you could get a Ford in any color you wanted as long as it was red. Um, this is the first Ford that was ever built with a back seat in it. And wow. the unique thing about this also, just a little piece of trivia here, is that steering wheel you notice is on the right right hand side here. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you're, it's like uh, England. Yeah, no it is. Um, the women back in, in the turn of the century were still wearing large skirts, large dresses here. And Henry Ford's wife, no exception there. and. Uh, she complained to Henry one night that when I drive the car, I have to get in 
on the street side because I can't get up behind the wheel with my uh. big dress. And she said, I'm afraid I'm going to get hit by getting in and out on the street. So one night he took the steering column, moved it over to the left side so she could get in and out on the curb side or the grass side. Now she's driving around De Dearborn and Detroit with a steering wheel on the left side and Olds and, and all these other manufacturers are getting really concerned. What is Henry Ford up to now? He's moved the steering wheel over on the left side. He must be up to something big. So everybody panicked and moved their steering wheels from the right side over to the left side, of course and it did. stuck today. And the only reason that happened is because he moved it over just for his wife, so she wouldn't be afraid of getting hit by getting on the curbside now, wow. and it stuck. But to this day, there's no federal law that says the steering wheel has to be on the left or right side. But just the standard. Just to keep his wife happy, that's how it well, happened it's... there. It worked back then, it works today, right? Yeah, that's right. Happy wife, happy life, I heard once. That's right. What's this? Little Niner. This sat up at Angola, uh, Indiana, near Tri-State uh, University at the time. Now it's Trine. Uh, this, this is a Valentine Diner. You could uh, get these in a couple different sizes where you could have uh, eight to ten stools in it there. And people made a good living on this. Uh, we get people that uh, um, went to tri Trine or Tri-State back in the day. Said, oh, we remember sitting in this all night studying and everything like that. But uh, just a really unique piece of American history there that we were fortunate enough to be able to preserve here at Natmus there. But yeah, it's perfect. It really is. Huh. All right. So we're circling into, I think what you told me is a our this newest is our This collection. is our newest display that we're just now putting together. This is what we're calling the Legends of NASCAR. And this is the first time these cars have ever been together. Uh, several of them have been at the uh, NASCAR uh, Hall of Fame Museum at Charlotte, but they've never been together. This particular number 43, this 1964 Plymouth was Richard Petty's car. We went down mm. about uh, uh, two months ago and picked it up, had a great visit with Richard on that. Petty Enterprises. It is. There. And, and just some little, little unique nuances on this that you don't think about on the car. And that's what, uh, you know, we're excited when we get this up and, and people can come up and take a look. But if you take a look, you see how they covered the headlight openings there. Oh, and those right. look custom made. And Richard said what those were, they used everything. Those are just the tops off of quart oil cans <laughs> that happened to fit that they stuck on there. Oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah. They, there was, you know, the holes are still here where they just took the hood ornament off. Uh huh. And just a lot of little things like that there. And uh, if you want to know more about it, come to Natmus and we'll tell you here because there's a lot to go with so that. This, this display will be open in time for yes, Labor, Labor Day. Day. Yes. Okay. That's One it. of the real stars also here is the number 42 car that was uh, owned by Marty Robbins, the country mm -hmm. western singer. Very, very rare car. He was what they called a privateer. He's funded himself totally. Uh, but a rare car, and we're just really, really fortunate to be able to have it. Absolutely. Uh, back behind the Petty car, the white number six, that's uh, David Pearson's 1964 Dodge. Mm -hmm. That has Hemi race motor number two in it there, an extremely rare car. And a unique car beside it, uh, the yellow Ford Talladega number 98. This was built for Benny Parsons. Benny Parsons, famous NASCAR driver, later commentator there uh, on, on television there. This was built by Holman and Moody Ford uh, in 1969. He ran it one year and then Ford pulled the sponsorship from NASCAR and Benny sold the car and I believe he went to driving a Chevy. But hmm. the unique feature about this car then or the unique history on it is that the car was sold after Parsons was done with it to an African-American driver named Wendell Scott. Mm -hmm. And Wendell Scott ran this car for three years and became the first African-American uh, in NASCAR. So this car really has a tremendous history. history with it there. It sure does. Excellent. This is going to be a great, I mean, it's already. It, it, it is, and it's, and it's fun. A lot of cool stories. So Muscle Car Row also over here, we have the Essex Cobra, which is owned by Essex Wire out of Fort Wayne. Uh, that is the winningest Cobra ever built. Uh, it was known as Ali the Dragon because it would every time they would go into a tight turn and back off the gas, it would pop and blow flame out both the pipes and the top of the hood on the carburetor. Look at that right there. But uh, yes, but uh, fully functional. We get it out once in a while and loosen it up, but 
The winning is still there. I do. I do. You don't have to. You get to, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to ask me twice on that one. Oh. The DeLorean, you'll see, is red. DeLoreans were always a traditional, they were stainless steel, so they were always a breast of silver look. It, the DeLorean wanted to develop, they wanted to paint them because on stainless steel, you can't repair it. You know, mm -hmm. you can't use body filler or whatever. There, you have to put new panels on. So they thought if we can paint them, then we can, you know, if in an accident or dings or dents there, uh, it'd be a whole lot cheaper. So Pittsburgh Paint Glass, PPG, spent two years with this particular car. Uh, developing a paint formula that would stick to stainless steel. At that time, they had paint that would stick to jet aircraft called mm -hmm. Emron, but it wouldn't stick to uh, stainless steel. So by the time they got it developed and everything, they painted 43 cars and DeLorean went broke. Ah. And so very, yeah, very few of them were painted there. Right. One of the stars here uh, that we have is right here. This is this little white 70 Cuda is uh, Hemi Cuda number one. Um, it's been featured in the Wall Street Journal and uh, 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 several national magazines. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, a real piece of history that was bought in Fort Wayne by uh, a local barber named Gary Dodane. And uh, he literally bought the winning lottery ticket at the time <laughs> on that. I didn't know it, did so, he? Not for a while. I think Gary paid five or eight hundred dollars for it. Had his buddies come over one night. They were going to go out and party and and everything. And one of them got to looking at the VIN and said, "Gary, there's a bunch of zeros in front of this first number. You better get somebody to look at it." Well, they did. The rest is history. There. So probably uh, over a two million dollar car. Wow. So when we say he hit the lottery, he did. That was a good find. <laughs> Zero number one zero 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 zero. And, and and these were made most by the Gendron Corporation in Toledo, Ohio. And the gentleman, one of the last owners of the corporation, had them restored and donated them to the museum. They were built. Most of them were built in the teens and early twenties. Um, it, it, they were very expensive. So it was only the wealthy kids that had something like this there. The Duesenbergs were built by a local gentleman um, named Don Detmer here in Auburn. And uh, he spent a, a lot of time getting those built, just magnificent pedal cars here. But it's just a, a one-on-one collection here that you, you won't find anywhere else in no, that one. So all. there are so many firsts and so many unique uh, experiences here at Natmus that uh, um, people are literally blown away once they get here. Yeah, I, it's been a while for me and I'm, I'm absolutely blown away. And there's been a lot of changes over the last, even said last year, Yeah. right? Yeah. And we need to go downstairs because Let's we do have a downstairs and I want to show you our, about our youth program because we have a youth program second to none and some opportunities that our kids are getting that uh, I wish I would have been young enough to be here today to do it and I'll show you. Excellent. The evolution of the truck and truck transportation industry. We start out with the early international harvesters here going basically from the, the horseless carriage or the buckboard buggy type of basic transportation and you'll walk down as we walk around here, you'll see the, uh, as we progress here on model years here. Hey, you can just see the progression. Tires you can. getting wider, you're seeing you know, and engine the, movement. The enclosed cabs, um, going from hard rubber tires to pneumatic tires. Again, you'll see the radiators behind uh, the engine there, again, for the protection. Um, several different makes that no longer exist, like the Noble right here. There's two of those that were manufactured in Noble County. There are very, oh, the very, Noble truck. Wow. very, very few of them in existence there, and we're fortunate to have two of them here at Natmus. We also have the Indiana trucks, which were made down at Marion. Harvester stuff. The, the, the hard rubber tires, I mean, they are hard. They are hard. <laughs> And this particular electric truck ran the streets of Chicago up until the oh. mid 50s. Uh, it was a Walker Electric. We're going to leave it unrestored, but uh, you can see where the battery box was, and it had several batteries under it that they would charge at night. And uh, this truck would literally ply the streets of Chicago there back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and like I say, up until the mid 50s there. Wow. Back here, we have a large collection of International Harvester toys that was donated by a gentleman from Spencerville. 
and uh, we've cleaned them, polished them, shined them, put in order, but this is one man's collection, toy collection, and he donated it to Natmus, and so we get to share it literally with the world. Incredible. So throughout this building, we continue with the eras of trucks, right? Does it, does it continue? Mm -hmm. You'll see scouts from the very first scouts mm -hmm. up to the, towards the end of the production. Just a variety of different trucks here. A lot of these internationals are, were built in Fort Wayne, right? Yes, they were, and some of them, several of them are prototypes uh, that were built between Chicago and Fort Wayne. Um, this particular one right here, the, the concept, the RXT, just a giant pickup truck um, that they showed the world that we could build one if we wanted to, but it's just an incredible yeah, they... pickup truck. <laughs> Why didn't they main, mainline this or mainstream it? So oh, goodness. they were going to, but I think finances got a little bit tight. Could you imagine having this on the road today? Yeah. It's like the best of both worlds. It's it is. A box oh, it, it's nice inside. Oh, it's, it's really nice. It had TVs in it, you know, and, and back in the day when you didn't put that stuff in a vehicle, let alone a truck. This is our Bonneville display down here. And we'll show you a little bit more about that later on the Bonneville display. Here's a Bonneville Streamliner that held the world's record here uh -huh. with one engine at over 300 mile an hour. The Harvester truck here in the 90s set world land speed records of uh, over 200 mile an hour. So they take these in Utah, right? Yes. Like salt flats? That's right. Exactly. Right there behind you. That would be what it would you'd okay. be looking at I've right there. I've been on those flats before. Have you? Yeah. Yep. As a kid. Awesome. Really cool. And then what I want to do is we'll take you back in the shop area. Okay. We have a youth program that we work with kids 13 to 17 years old on a variety of different skills. We teach them woodworking skills on how to bend wood to make patterns like for early auburns and such like that. We teach them electrical skills. We do sheet metal skills, uh, some upholstery. And the idea is not to make the next great mechanics, but to give these kids an experience that they would never get anywhere else. Absolutely. Um, we have kids that literally come. Uh, one mother brings has been bringing her son up here. We meet Wednesday night from six to eight. She brings them up every week from Dayton, Ohio. Oh my gosh. We've had kids, we have kids from Michigan. We have them from Illinois, we have Indiana. Um, just a unique opportunity here, but these are all the cars that they get to work on. And then once they get the car worked on and get it running, we have a test track set up that we let the kids with an adult volunteer take it out and drive it. So you'll That's see, so cool. you'll see 13 year old kids driving, you know, a, a cord or whatever here. I mean, I've heard a, you know, shop class and career centers, but this is this is this all hands-on, a variety of different experiences you'll never get a chance. This is our unique piece right here. This belly tanker is the one that we're going to try and go after a couple world land speed records here uh, next year at Bonneville, depending on salt conditions here. We're going to go after for the 18 and under record uh, and then a 21 and under record here with this car right here in a couple different classes. So we're going to give the kids that opportunity. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine. I love that they're building it, they're learning, and then they actually get to drive. They do. That's... We actually have a, uh, um, a semi-tractor with an automatic transmission, the late model one that was donated that uh, we uh, let the kids drive with an adult around our track here. So they get experience of driving an actual semi-tractor. Uh, we have the parents come in, we give them that opportunity. So it just, it's just all about trying to give unique experiences to, to people that we're very fortunate and blessed to be able to do. Right, well, that's that's the passion of, we talk about worldwide, the power your passion, right? It's not just mm -hmm. owning a car, or it's enjoying car, enjoying all the things that come like with the car industry, whether it's building something or it's riding or driving. I mean, 
I had no idea that you're doing this with youth. It, it is, and and it's to get that next generation fired up and get them in off the phone and get them into something you know <laughs> exactly. like this here. Yes. It really is because if we don't, this whole industry is going to die out. Right, and it's pretty fragile right now. This is firing me up. So these two cars right here are were our great race, uh, the Hemmings Motor News great race team here. Yep. Uh, this year it started in uh, Saint Augustine, Florida, and ended in. Colorado Springs. The maroon car right there, our youth won their class with that one right there. So they were the winners, the champions in the X Cup division. And uh, we're going to start again. We'll do it again next year. Next year, it'll start in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And then I think it ends in Bangor, Maine. So, wow. but just a unique opportunity. Our, our adult volunteers are great at helping the kids. And um, if you're watching this video, you want to contribute, donate, sponsor, volunteer. This is a great opportunity. It is. It really is. It really is. If you want to help kids and, and just give them an experience and opportunities that they'll never get before, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is what it's all right about. Here in Auburn, Indiana. Awesome. Well, Dave, this was, uh, you know, I've been here before, but an eye opening experience. So many new things, the new displays, the youth program, my goodness. Uh, so we have the uh, Destination Auburn uh, ACD Festival coming up. There's going to be a lot of people. Uh, why should they stop by Natmus uh, over that weekend, over that week? To take advantage of the experience that we have to offer. There's so mm -hmm. many unique things here at Natmus that you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, I don't think you'll find this stuff in any one particular museum. But yet it's all gathered right here with the Natmus Auburn experience here. Um, our, our volunteers are always escorting people through talking about the various things that we have to offer, exhibits, displays, the vehicles, and so on here. And there's literally something here for everybody that you may have never seen before and may never get a chance to see it again. Just like the Future Liner to start with. That's what I love. Um, of course, we have all the ACB cars all over the place uh, here during the festival, but we have, this is such a unique place for, and, and like I said, there's something for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have buddies Absolutely. that are just muscle car guys. I have, you know, my son who's into like pre-war stuff of all things. You have the future line. I mean, I, the list goes on and on. So make sure to come out and, and support Natmus by coming here and, and telling your friends about it. Of course, you've seen this video, so you, you've seen a little bit of a glimpse of it, but there's something about being here and hearing it and seeing it in person. Uh, so come out to Natmus. Uh, thank you, Dave. Oh, my uh, pleasure. For your time and uh, for giving us a, a tour. And uh, we'll see you on Worldwide TV.